And I have been blessed yesterday afternoon and today in visiting with uh, brother and sister Lindsay. Brother Lindsay uh, was here today and we recorded the lighthouse and it'll be on tomorrow night. Now I would much rather you be here tomorrow night than sitting home watching the lighthouse. And I think you'll receive more, and, and, and most of you that are here can't get the lighthouse anyway, so I don't really have to worry too much about that. But uh, we will be ministering to those that do watch the lighthouse. But I'll tell you, in talking and visiting with these folks, I feel like my life has been enriched because of his teaching and uh, the fellowship that we have had. And it's my privilege tonight to yield the pulpit once again to our teacher, our evangelist. And I believe that since Saturday, our friend, Dr. Stanford Lindsay. Would you just make him welcome, please? Amen. And good evening, friends. That's good. Better to start than we had Sunday, wasn't it? Amen. It's a delight to be here again tonight. Good to see all of you. It's always good to get together and talk about God's Word. Am I on? I am not on. We'll start over. Uh, as I was saying, it's good to be here this evening with you and to share in the things of the Lord we've enjoyed yesterday in the services. God was good to us yesterday, wasn't he? If I received their baptism of the Spirit, I would suppose some of them were healed. Any of you receive a touch in your body yesterday or last night? Praise God. Marvelous. And uh, so tonight, here we are again to discuss the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, I brought to your attention Sunday morning what I call prophecy and doctrine. Then last night, we dealt with the day of Pentecost. Tonight, we're going to deal with Acts chapter 10, which has to do with the house of Cornelius, also called the Gentile Pentecost, because this is the time the Gentiles are being brought into the church. It's amazing how some folks think you have to be perfect or have all problems solved before you can come to Jesus. That has tricked us for years, because we believe that. We listened to it, we believed it. That's not true at all. You come to God just as you are. God accepts you as you are and takes you from that point forward. Now, if we can remember these kind of things, we can help ourselves. So if you fall into difficulty, repent, get straight, get up and go on. Hallelujah. I read just the other day, someone said, failure is not falling down. It's the refusal to get up. Right. Right. Hallelujah. And those who get up and move on, why, they're the ones who do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, I will be answering major questions every night. Tomorrow night, I'll be answering the question, can a person get a wrong experience when seeking for the infilling of the Spirit? Is there a counterfeit or false tongues? We're going to discuss that tomorrow night. Is gibberish ever spoken when one speaks in tongues? And how do you know? This is worth your time tomorrow night. And then, of course, Wednesday night will be the closing night and the final message here. I will be dealing with a subject answering the question, is holiness a criterion to receive the baptism of the Spirit? How holy do you have to be? Who's going to set the standards? This is very interesting in our time. Now, my subject matter for tomorrow night simply will be, why speak with tongues? And in this message, I'll be dealing with the subject from a psychological point of view. What are members of the medical and psychiatric professions saying about speaking in tongues? And again, I say if you have friends or those relatives of yours who are in the nursing or medical professions, invite them to the service. We have found they've been interested to hear what we have to say on this subject. So tonight then, we come and together we read... Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> and it reads like this. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, 
a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, who gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when Cornelius looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel who spoke unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of those that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and minds this evening. In our story tonight, we're dealing with the centurion of the Roman army of a very distinguished family of Rome. In fact, one of the few persons of distinction to become a Christian in the New Testament. Now, even before he came to Jesus Christ, he was a man of character and righteousness. In fact, I bring to your attention that righteousness in the New Testament simply means rightness. He did what was right, and God honors these kinds of people. Perhaps he was a semi-proselyte to Judaism, though we're not quite sure. He may have kept some of the laws, but I would be sure he did not keep the dietary laws, for any of you who are acquainted with the military know they do eat in various and odd ways. I'll never forget when I first entered the Naval Service many years ago as a youngster, we had cornbread and beans for breakfast on Wednesday morning and Saturday morning. Now that's not really bad once you get used to the idea. But if you haven't been used to eating that way, it does seem unusual. And, uh, but uh, this man probably did not keep the dietary laws. But we do know that he prayed much and gave alms to the poor, and God has always commended people for these acts. And uh, so, uh, now there's some principles involved here that if we can get hold of, it can be helpful to us. In the first place, this man did what he knew to do, and God gave him for the light. If you and I live up to what we know, we can ex expect God to take us on further. If we don't live up to what we know, we have no reason to believe that God will divulge any more to us. He doesn't need to if we're not going to use what we have, you see. I've heard people say, I wish I knew more about the Lord. Now, there's only one way to know more about the Lord. That's to crack the book and read it. Contrary to some opinion, you cannot lay a cassette player under your pillow, turn it on and go to bed at night, and wake up educated in the morning. It simply won't work that way. Fact is, most of our skulls are too thick anyway. No, you have to read the book if you want to know more about the Lord. I've heard people say, I wish I had more faith. Now, faith seems to be a thing of experience rather than knowledge. In other words, if you act on an impulse of faith and you find it works, you do it again, you find it works, you learn by experience that will be there. In other words, you live on the cutting edge, the forward edge, the leading edge. You learn to do that. Now, if you don't practice that, then you never have experiences like God would like for you to have. It takes a little uh, nerve to jump out there, get on the leading edge, and believe God for great and mighty things. But you find that God is there when you do that. Now, before Jesus came, the Jews' religion was the way to God. Many Gentiles became converts to Judaism, or as one New Testament term calls them, the God-fearers. They became that route to find the one true God. In fact, it was that group that the Apostle Paul appealed to. They were the fringe group of Judaism that he could appeal to because they were not Jews entirely by inheritance, and he could appeal to them and point them to Jesus Christ. And so we're finding that God took this man on past that into a full and free salvation and an infilling of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, this is an amazing story, a story of a direct intervention. God, the angel, actually came down and met with this man. 
I've heard your prayer, your fast, your vision, an angel of God came. And uh, send men to Joppa, get Simon Peter, he'll tell you what you ought to do. Now, I have been amazed in some of our churches. It seems to me how glibly some of our people will say, God told me to do whatever he told them to do. I've often wondered, how did God tell them? I try to be spiritual, and I don't hear voices. The ones I do hear, I don't trust. You out there? Because it might be a figment of my own imagination, you know. How did God tell them? Well, I don't know. Now, I will say this. I believe God does talk to people. I have no problem with that. I'll never forget many years ago, I was a young preacher down in Southern California. And I do not say this disparagingly, but I had a man and a wife in my church, middle-aged people, who were probably some of the poorest people I've ever met. They didn't have anything. Lived in a shack of a house. And, and I don't say this disparagingly, they were probably some of the most ignorant people I've ever met. But let me say this, some of the most godly people I've ever met. And I used to love to visit their home because they talked like they had a personal relationship with God. The lady of the house would say, I talked to the Lord today, and I told the Lord, whatever she told him, and the Lord told me, whatever he told her, and this young preacher had the feeling that's probably just exactly the way it happened. I haven't had that experience, but some have. So there's many ways God deals with people, some by a direct voice. He deals with me more by impression. I feel impressed to do certain things. And that's the way I put it, that God talks to me. Now, there's another point here. This man, when he was told what to do, he immediately carried it out. He gets two soldiers to serve, serve two servants to the soldier, sends them down to find Simon Peter. Bear with me and think back for a moment. You know, we each have to learn how God deals with us individually. Has there been a time when you felt the Lord wanted you to do some particular thing? You, you thought about it, you prayed about it, you believed it really was God, but you didn't do it. Two, three days later, it's begun to fade out. And in a week's time, the whole thing's gone. Whereas, had we taken action, if we thought it was God, it might have been amazing what would have come out of it. But we're so insensitive sometimes to the impulses that God gives us to move in the way he wants us to move. If we can just catch up on that, it would be so helpful. I remember the story of another centurion in, I believe, Luke chapter 7. Uh, the story, this, this uh, centurion had built the Jews a synagogue. Of course, they were great friends of this man. And he had a servant that got sick and died, or was dying. He was very sick. And they sent to Jesus, and Jesus said, I'll come down and heal him. The centurion said, wait a minute, Lord, no. I'm not worthy you come under my roof. I also am a man under authority. In other words, I know what power is. I know what authority is. If I say to one, he comes or goes, if a superior says to me, the imperial eagle, we'll see this carried out. He says, Lord, I understand that. All you've got to say is the word, and it will be done. Jesus said, I've never seen such faith, great faith, not in all Israel. On Navy ships at sea, the commanding officer is nearly God. If any of you have been in the Navy, you know that. Now, if the man on the bridge, the captain, wants the engine room to do something, wants the engineers to do something, he does not have to go down there to tell him. All he's got to do is get the word down there, and it's going to happen. You see, that's the point. If we can only learn who's got the power, Jesus, and depend upon that, it would be marvelous what we might see in some time. Hallelujah. Now, notice another thing. When God is going to work in dealing with people, he works on all ends of the line. He's going to have to with Simon Peter. This man is not the easiest man to work with. But God is going to work the whole thing out. So now we look down at Joppa. Peter is down in Joppa. Somebody has not got the meal ready. He's gone on the housetop. That's like going on the back porch in Oklahoma and Texas, you know. And so while he's up there, he says he fell into a trance. And he saw, as it were, a great sheet let down from heaven, held by the four corners. And in the sheet were all manner of birds, beasts, and reptiles, clean and unclean, according to the Mosaic Code. And as he looks upon the scene, he hears the voice of the Spirit say, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. And the bigoted Jew says, Not I, Lord, nothing common or unclean has ever 
come into my mouth. In other words, I have never eaten anything clean. I've kept the law. That's what he's saying. And the voice says, what I've cleansed, don't you call common or unclean. And this happens three times. And finally, the sheet is lifted back up into the heavens. And Peter is thinking about what this could mean when the three men from Caesarea arrive. And the Spirit says to Peter, three men are seeking for you. Go down there and go with them and don't doubt a thing. So he invites them in. They spend the night there. And then the next day, they go up to Caesarea. Now, our scene shifts back to Caesarea. This is Caesarea by the sea. There are two Caesareas in the New Testament. Caesarea Philippi and Caesarea uh, by the sea. And uh, I've been over there. They built back the old Roman fort where it probably exactly was. The Jews are very exact in these things. And I can nearly see the scene where all of this took place. Now, notice Cornelius has a full house. Friends, loved ones, relatives, kinfolk are there, and I'm sure a great part of the military are there because he's a leading military man. And someone has pointed out that in the Roman army, the centurions were the men of the greatest character because of the particular job they had to carry out. And so he's got a full house there. I'll never forget some years ago, I was the chaplain to the 12th Marine Regiment in Okinawa. And uh, God was good to us there. My, we had, in a matter of just a matter of a couple of months, I had two packed chapels every Sunday morning for church, full houses. Now, let me say this. It is true God was with us, but we had another thing in our favor. The camp commander came to church every Sunday. And of course, the way the military thinks, if it's good enough for the colonel, it's good enough for everybody. And in that one camp, we had 323 United States Marines get saved in eight months. Praise God. Can you say a good amen? Amen. God moved in a marvelous way. Hallelujah. So Peter arrives up there. Cornelius comes out to meet him, falls before him. Peter says, stand up. I'm a man as you are. What did you want? Cornelius told him of his own vision. All of a sudden, all lights go on in Peter's mind. Now he understands what God is trying to show him. Now we have a change in the manual. <clears throat> Acts 10 at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, for he is Lord of all, that word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now, that's a, that's a hint back to Matthew 3.11 and uh, Acts 1 and 5. <clears throat> How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Let me pause just a minute. Here again, we have this primitive gospel thing. You killed him, God raised him. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. We have it again here. That's the gospel. You killed him. God buried. He was dead and buried. He's raised the third day for our justification or because of our justification. Now, that's the gospel. Once a man, a woman, boy, or girl has heard this, he's heard enough to get saved. God doesn't have to show him anymore. Now we're responsible for our own soul salvation. He died on the cross for you and for me. God raised him up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and of the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. And they of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter. Now, Peter had taken six Christian Jews with him to be witnesses. That's what this is referring to here. 
Uh, they were astonished because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now this is a marvelous thing here. Peter is preaching, and while the man is preaching, the Gentiles begin speaking in tongues. Now, if you're thinking people, the question surely must come to your mind, when did the Gentiles get saved? There is no altar call. Nobody said, everybody close your eyes, don't look, please raise your hands. No, none of that. In fact, that's an American invention. They didn't do that in the New Testament. I'll tell you one thing, when people start talking in tongues, you can write it down, they are saved. Hallelujah. Some time ago, well, about three times, Mrs. Lindsay and I have been to Alaska preaching, and uh, very enjoyable, really. And one thing about that state, if a preacher gets up there, somehow they get the word all over the whole state, you're up there. And everybody wants you to come before you come home. They're so glad to have a preacher up there, it seems, an evangelist, missionary, some type like that, and while well, they've got good pastor. And so while we were in Anchorage, Alaska, from a Sunday to a Sunday in First Assembly, I forget all the details, but we had a night off during the week. And uh, four small churches down on the Kenai Peninsula somehow heard that we were there and that we had a night off. I forgot how they got us the word, but the word came to us, would you come to us and preach on your night off? Well, a Pentecostal preacher will go anywhere to preach. Hallelujah. And I'll never forget, this was in February of one year. Cold was it cold. Someone said to me, well, why are you so nutty as to go to Alaska in the wintertime? Very good reason. In the spring and the summer, they hunt and fish and do their work. In the winter, it gets so cold, all they can do is go to church. So that's why we're there in the wintertime. We caught a small plane and flew down to Kenai. <coughs> Four small churches had come together for a one-night preaching mission. And that night, I preached on the baptism of the Spirit. Probably some 85 or 90 people were there with their pastor, four churches. <clears throat> I'd spoken on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I gave an invitation. And when I did, 16 people stood up and came forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And just like you saw here last night, stand right across the podium there. And uh, as quickly as the pastors and I laid hands on, 16 people spoke with tongues. Good meeting, any way you look at it. And we were certainly pleased with what God had done. Well, some time later, I told this to somebody, and they got awfully concerned and said, Brother, you ought to be awfully careful, uh, because you may get people filled with the Holy Spirit who are not even saved. The fact of the matter was, 11 of those people weren't saved when they came forward. And here they're all talking in tongues. Well, you see, our problem is we, we have a hard time letting God be God. Honey, God can save them like He wants to. They may or may not kneel at your altar. Altars. I like to see that, but it doesn't always happen that way. Let God save them like he wants to. We've had people in our services receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit sitting in their seat back there. I just came up from Mexico a couple of weeks ago. It was down in Mexico for a week preaching. And in one church, great, a large church and a full house, and uh, what was it? Some 20 people came forward to get the baptism. And one lady, I'm dealing with her, and she receives the baptism and starts talking in tongues, and the pastor says to me, she's not saved. Really, just to help him, I had her say the Lord's, say the prayer to get saved. No, she's already talking in tongues. You see what I mean? In other words, our problem is, generally the way we think is, we want them to come, we want to tell them all we know so they can get saved and all of this, and then want them to get filled with the Spirit, but by the time we've told them all we know, they're so confused, they can't get saved anyway. We've confused the issue, you see. Better to get them in and get them hooked than tell them what they got. You don't clean the fish till you catch them. Hallelujah. Kind of like a good marriage, you know. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy. The boy thinks the girl's beautiful, and that's a matter of speculation, perhaps. The girl thinks the boy's intelligent, and that's generally a matter of question. And uh, they're going to get married, and they counsel with a pastor, and after the pastor talks with them, they decide to get married anyway. <laughs> uh, 
And everybody knows they can't make it. Mother knows the boy's not good enough for the girl. You know how it is. But they get married. And, of course, the boy's promised he's going to work all of his life to make a living. She's going to take care of the house and all that, you know. Boy, here are the bills, the car, the house, utilities, food. Oops! There's the baby. And then you see them 35, 40 years on down the pipe. Kids are all raised up and doing well. Mom and Daddy still holding hands, walking down the street together. They have made it. They've made it. Now, they are a lot smarter now than they were when they started. They've had a lot of on-the-job training. If they had known now, if they had known then what they know now, they may not have gotten married. That's why God has dumb young people getting married. They don't know. <laughs> Boy, a lot of grit and faith, I guess. But it's been going on for generations, hasn't it? They've been making it, sure. But we, isn't that the way it is when you came to Jesus? You didn't know all about it, did you? You didn't know what you were going to go through, did you? And he didn't tell you. He couldn't tell you. You may not have been able to take it. But all you knew was he saved you and forgave you and gave you a hope in eternity. And you said, I do. That's all you needed to know. Praise God forever. Now you've gone through a lot of things since then. There's been heartaches, there's been troubles, there's been financial problems, all kind of, but you're still going on. And now this, you're so far along now, no use to turn back now. To whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Now that's about the way that it is. Hallelujah. <clears throat> And so they received a marvelous infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you what, I've had people say to me, we want another Pentecost. I don't really believe you do. Most of our people don't know what Pentecost is. Honey, if you got another Pentecost, there'd be some things that really shake you loose. I've told people things you can't, can't believe. They think I'm a little bit off the wall. In Pentecostal churches, strange things are happen when God begins to move. I'll never forget, I was in one church, God moved mightily. A young man got the baptism of the Spirit. Now, he came up to me and says, do you know how I got it? I said, how did you get it? He said, when you had laid hands on me, I saw it written on the wall, and I read it off. Now, that, he told me, I didn't tell him. I had another man come to me one time and say, you know how I got it? I said, no. He says... He'd been in the meeting several nights. The first night he said, in my mind's eye, I was looking down a tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, I saw a flashing neon light just flashing. I didn't get the baptism that night. The next night, it was, the tunnel was about half distance. Still saw the neon light. I did not get the baptism. Now, the third night, he says, when he looked, in his mind, looking down the tunnel, it was short now, and what appeared to be a neon light flashing was a neon sign with the word Sharon. Now, the crowd around him did not know what's going on in his mind. But somebody said, Brother, God's given you a word. Say it. He said, Sharon, and started talking in tongues. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you what, honey. Let God be God. It might be amazing what happens in your life. Now, I used to be, because of my vast education, I used to be a little hesitant to tell these things until one day in the Fuller Theological Seminary Library, I picked up a book this thick called The Pentecostals. A history of the Pentecostals around the world. They've been an amazing bunch of people. What's happened amongst the Pentecostals is something else. If you want to move of God, let God be God. Let him do what he wants to. Let him be himself and let you be yourself. Let God glorify himself in your midst. Take the bonds off. Take your hands off. Let God be God. Don't think you can figure it all out. You can't. That's hindered us so much that we want to figure it out. We want to analyze it. We want to chart it. We Cut it out. You can't do that. The Spirit of God is too marvelous, too big for all of that. I'd rather say, Lord, do what you want to do. Just let me enjoy your presence. Just let me enjoy. Let me enjoy. Raise your hand with me. Shout a little bit. Let me enjoy your goodness. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me enjoy. 
praise God forever and forever. Amen and amen. Well, marvelous what God did on this occasion. Now, Acts chapter 11 is actually more interesting than Acts 10. Wouldn't you have thought that first assembly down in Jerusalem, when they heard that the Gentiles had received the baptism of the Spirit, they would have had a praise meeting. They would have said, oh, hallelujah, thank God the Gentiles are getting saved. Isn't it simply marvelous? Wouldn't you have thought that? The fact is they didn't like it. They did not like it. And this is the church that has the great commission going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now somebody has done it and the Gentiles have got saved and filled with the Spirit and the church doesn't like it. The church has been its own biggest hindrance for 2,000 years. We've grumbled among ourselves. We've fought among ourselves when we all have got together and fought the world and the devil and everything out there. Glory to God. We've been our own biggest hindrance. Get your minds off of the fight with yourself. Get your mind on what's going on out yonder. Unite and go together to fight against Satan and the works of sin. Amen. They didn't like it. And this is the church that had the great commission go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They had the commission. Somebody does it, and the church doesn't like it. Now, I don't know your area, so I'm free to say what, what I'm going to say. I don't know your environs at all. I would suppose, though I don't know this is true, <clears throat> but I would suppose there are people in the neighborhood that if they came in and says, we love Jesus and we want to join the church. There may be someone who said, no, wait a minute, they're not our kind of people. Wait a minute. Whereas if they genuinely are saved, you'd open your arms and say, come in, brother. Come in, sister, join us. We need you and you need us. Let's get together. Let's preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say me a good amen? Amen. Take them in. Make them part of you. Well, God does do things the hard way. He really does. Number one, these are Gentiles. The Jews hated the Gentiles. And of course the Gentiles hated the Jews. It worked both ways, you know. And uh, uh, so that's the way it is. But this is the story of the Gentiles coming into the church. According to Ephesians 2 or 3, the middle wall of partition is being broken down. The one body, the Jew. The one body, the Gentile. Now they're going to become one body, the church. And this is the story of the Gentiles coming into the church. But there was one worse thing than this. Not only were the Gentiles, they were the hated Roman army. They could not take this. How can God save a Roman soldier? More than they could understand. The thing is, oftentimes our view is pretty narrow, isn't it? We don't see how God can save somebody. Honey, God stretched it when he saved you. <laughs> You have to say a good amen. He had to stretch it when he brought you and me in. Then let him stretch it to bring the next guy in. Hallelujah. And uh, I, during the war years, I was in the Navy. I'll never forget, I'd preach at some of our churches. Somebody would always corner me and say, Chaplain, if you're a Christian, how can you be in the Navy? I had no problem with that at all. Finally, I had to just tell them, look, that must be your problem. It's not mine. Now, God loves the military. Let me tell you something. In all those men who are in the Mideast today, there are hundreds and thousands of Christians there. And I heard Pat Robertson say something the other day that I believe. Even though this war is terrible, all wars are terrible. Yet who knows but what this may be the breaking of the Muslim world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! God, what the devil causes wars, God can take what the devil did and make it work out to good. Amen. I believe that. Because there will be many Bibles left there when our boys come home. There will be many tracts left there. Some Muslims are going to read them. Who knows, there may be a great revival in that place before it's over with. Because our people have been there. Well, but let's don't jump on the church too quickly. Change comes slowly. 
In fact, somebody said that the church in Jerusalem, the Pentecostal church in Jerusalem, offered burnt sacrifices for the next 25 years after Pentecost. You see, getting filled with the Spirit didn't change everything in a moment. Culture doesn't change that fast. Some of us have trouble with that. If a Catholic gets saved and still talks about Mary, we get all set, bent out of shape about it. Leave them alone. God can deal with that. If that's the worst thing they got, they're in pretty good shape. Sure, don't worry about that. That's culture of thousands of years. But I find that the charismatic Catholics pretty soon aren't talking about Mary anymore. They're talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. So we need to learn some things like this. Change takes slow. Have there, have there been people in the church you thought were awfully slow and just couldn't quite catch up? Leave them alone. They're going to make it. They might be pokey, but they're going to be there. Have you ever got disgusted with yourself when you thought you couldn't make the change fast enough? You couldn't do it like you... Don't ride yourself so hard. You're going to make it. You might be pokey, but you're going to get there. When the trumpet blows, we're all going together. <laughs> Glory to God. The pokey ones are going to be with the fast ones. We'll all be together. I had a Baptist pastor tell me one time that when the rapture takes place, the Baptists are going to go first. I said, how do you figure that out? He said, well, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> I said to him, well, you said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> He's a very fine classmate of mine from a Baptist seminary. No, we're all going to live together. But let me say this. For the church to move along, you slow pokes, how about stepping it up a little bit? And you speedball, slow down a little bit. Let the church move together. Hallelujah. That's the way that we get the job done. Now, so when Peter came back down to Jerusalem, they're going to have a special general council just for Peter. They're going to take his papers. And he's ready for them. Of course, I can tell you, you know, Peter's not the dumbest Jew alive. I haven't seen too many dumb Jews, have you? No. When Peter was going up to Caesarea, he had an idea he was going to get in trouble. So he took six Christian Jews with him, brethren, believers. He wanted them to be witnesses. Now he's going to need them. And so when he gets down, back down to, to Jerusalem, they call a council. And boy, they got a terrible charge on him eating with the Gentiles. Now to us that doesn't sound very bad, but it was to them, because that was against the law, you know, and uh, that's what they had him on. Now, Peter is giving an account for himself. He says in Acts 11, verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. Now when he makes this statement, gives this dating the beginning, the beginning is the Pentecost, the birthday of the church, when the Holy Spirit first fell. He is saying, he's going to say, they got the same thing we got, we heard them do it. They spoke in tongues. That's the point here. The Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here again is a reference to Matthew 3.11 and Acts 1.5. <clears throat> For as much then as God gave them the same gift as he did unto us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, let me point out, <clears throat> the way they knew that God had accepted the Gentiles was the fact that Gentiles spoke with tongues. None of this thing say, well, well, you know they got it by faith. They didn't talk like that. We heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's how the Jewish church knew that God had accepted the Gentiles. Now, that is an initiatory experience. That should happen with men and women, boys, girls who come to Jesus today. If we sell out and make a clean-cut decision and no one's taught against it, we have not been influenced against it, it would be a very simple thing for people to uh, speak in tongues at the time they get saved. And we're finding out in our land today and around the world where we've been that when men and women understand this, they have no problem entering in and being filled with the Spirit, manifesting the Spirit in the speaking with tongues. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, of course, as you know, my thesis is 
that believers ought to speak in tongues when they get saved and they become believers. Some time ago, when I was still in the Navy, I was the chaplain in the Navy's guided missile cruiser, USS Galveston. That's when we still had the big cruisers, the big guns. And uh, we had a thousand men on board. I was the chaplain. And uh, we were getting ready to deploy to the Western Pacific. So we were on operations at sea off the coast of San Diego for about two weeks in preparation for this. The helicopter brought our mail aboard every day from the coast. And so one day the helo came aboard. I was in my stateroom. My yeoman brought my mail to me in my stateroom. So I'm sitting at my desk opening the mail as we're sailing. <clears throat> and so I came upon a letter from a mother from Texas. She says, Dear Chaplain, I am Mrs. So-and-so, mother of one of your sailors. He's a good boy, but he got into a little trouble. Will you please talk with him? Now I learned a couple of things there. When mother said he got into a little trouble, that was the biggest understatement of the year. He was in big trouble had had one court-martial and was waiting on a second one. And I learned another thing. All mother's boys are good boys. They just get with the other mother's boys who are all good boys, and all the good boys get in trouble. And so this lad was in serious trouble. After going through my mail, I looked at the ship's roster. I located the lad by name. I found that he was a fireman, <clears throat> and at that particular moment was on watch in the forward fire room of that ship down in the hole. So I dialed on the telephone, got the petty officer of the watch, and he named himself, and I said, this is the chaplain. What do you want, chaplain? I said, have you got so-and-so down there? The petty officer says, yeah, what's the matter? Is he in trouble again? The boy was famous, everybody knew him. I said, no, I just want to talk to him. Will you send him up? Yeah, I'll send him up, chaplain. Well, from where the lad was down in the hull of that ship, it took him some 10 or 12 minutes to get up where I was. And as we're sailing along, there's a knock on my stateroom door, and I yell, come in. The door opened slowly and cautiously, and there stood a tall, lanky, skinny, red-headed, freckle-faced, blue-eyed Texas sailor. He had a smile on his face from ear to ear. All Texans are happy. <clears throat> this boy didn't have a problem in the world. 999 men had a problem. He didn't have any problem. Have you seen people like that? No. And he came in. He was grinning. And Now, my first impulse was really jump on the sailor. He's been bad. I'm going to square him away. You know, I'm going to really give him a good talking to. All of a sudden, the Lord changed the chaplain's heart. That's no small thing either. And I changed my whole idea. The thought came to me, who do you think you are? No one else will help this lad. How do you think you're going to help him? So I looked at the sailor, and just to get the conversation started, I says, where are you from? I already knew. He says, Texas. I said, where do you go to church? He says, I don't go to church. Have you ever? No. Well, I didn't have to have a high-powered sermon. This boy didn't know anything anyway, so... You know the little verses you learn in Sunday school? I said, have you ever heard this? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you heard that? He says, no. Over here it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever heard that? No. This boy didn't know anything. I wonder how this boy get out of the state of Texas and no Baptist had cornered him yet. And here he is out in the Navy in trouble and we got him. So I, I talked to him for a bit, told him the gospel story, how Jesus died for him. Then I said to this sailor, you know what? He says, what? I said, right now you could tell, pray and tell God you're a sinner. Ask God to forgive you. Ask the Lord to come into your heart. He would save you and forgive you all your sins and give you everlasting life. The sailor says, he would. I said, yeah, I just told you. Oh. <clears throat> After a few moments, I told him, I said, would you like to pray and ask God to save you? Forgive your sin, give you eternal life? The sailor says, yeah. 
I said, all right, bow your head. He bowed his head, and I'm going I'm to lead him in prayer. He said, wait a minute, I don't know how to pray. I said, well, I'll tell you what to say. He says, okay. So he bowed his head. I led him in the simple sinner's prayer. You know how we do. Told the Lord he was a sinner. Asked God to forgive him. Asked the Holy Spirit to come into his heart. Give him eternal life. He prayed like that. Then I had him, I had him say the amen to his prayer. Then I prayed for him. Now we're sitting side by side in my stateroom. And then I prayed for him that God would hold him true and all this. You know. <clears throat> After I finished my prayer, we both looked up and looked at each other. And he looked at me and grinned and said to me, you know what? I said, what? He said, I feel different. <laughs> I said, well, you even look different. <laughs> After a few moments, the thought came to me, why not take this sailor all the way? He doesn't know anything anyway. <laughs> This man's fresh caught. He doesn't even know the argument. <clears throat> love it, love it, love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you talk about a high-powered conference. This was it. <clears throat> Finally, I said to the sailor, "You know what?" He said, "What?" I said, "Would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in a language you never ever learned?" He says, yeah. <laughs> I said, all right, bow your head. <laughs> he bowed his head. I laid my, first I read him, you know, Acts 2 and 1 to 4 about the day of Pentecost. Then I read him Acts chapter 10, the, the centurion. Here's a military man, got saved, filled the Holy Spirit, and spoke a language he never, ever learned. The sailor says, he did? I said, yeah, I just told you. Oh. He bowed his head. I laid my hand on that red-headed Texas sinner. I didn't even give him any instruction. I just said, God, fill him with the Holy Ghost. That's all I said. And I just watched him. He had his head tucked in. Finally, real slow, his head came up. His eyes wide open. You know you can get the baptism with your eyes open. Eyes wide open. Then he raised his hands up. And sitting in my stateroom next, next, right next to me, this sailor began to talk in tongues. Yeah. Give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 20 minutes before this sailor is not saved, here he is saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. I told somebody that who had tarried 30 years once, and they said, do you think it'll last? <laughs> well, sure it'll last. He got the same thing you did. He just didn't wait 30 years. He got it all right at once. That's the way it ought to be. Well, we were still at sea a couple of days later, and I went up on the main deck just to watch the operation to see. At, in the Navy, at sea, it's always interesting to go up and see what's happening. And I was on the main deck, and this petty officer, the sailor for whom this man worked, saw me. He says, Chaplain, come here, come here. I thought his world was coming apart. I said, what's the matter, mate? He said, what did you do to my sailor? What did you tell him? I said, what's the matter? Is he, is he uh, failing you again? He said, no. He said, since you talked to him, he's changed. Now he's doing a good job. I can count on him. He's dependable. He's going to be a good sailor. But what did you do to him? What did you tell him? I said, all, I'm, all I know is he got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. That sailor walked up and said, I know something happened. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> I understand that when the ship went into port, the sailor was after the petty officer to get him to go to church. <laughs> well, that's the way God moves. All right, a few moments about practical factors. We make it so difficult sometimes it seems. Now, Sunday morning we laid hands on. Some people's lips begin to tremble. We call that stammering lips, according to Isaiah 28, 11. At that moment, if a person would simply refuse to speak in English or any acquired language, and give voice to it, he would be speaking in tongues in a matter of moments. We saw this here Sunday morning, and we need to learn that, you see. And then when one does speak in tongues, then he should believe that that's it. We've had people speak in tongues and didn't believe they got it. What do you want God to do to you? Speaking in tongues is it. And we need to understand that. And of course, a step of faith is necessary. Faith is necessary to get anything from God, you know. It's a requirement. 
And uh, somebody came to me one time and said, I'd like to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I don't have the faith. The answer to that is, then use my faith. It'll work. It's worked nearly 14,000 times. A.B. Simpson said the same thing for divine healing. Use my faith. Don't we many times count on others' faith? Sure we do. Then we can certainly learn to do that. <coughs> I've heard people say in time past, when a person speaks in tongues, the Holy Spirit speaks through them. Not at all. Not at all. Paul says when the one prays in tongues, he says, my spirit prays. It is I. I am the one who does it. Now, if you learn that, it takes the fear out of the whole thing. It's because I am the one who is going to do it. I can do it or I can refuse to do it. Because as I pointed out previously, it certainly is a matter of the will. All right. The Holy Spirit does not speak in tongues. We're the ones who do the speaking in tongues. He simply prompts us that we can do it. And if we'll give vent to it, give place to it, then it takes place. Hallelujah. And there's a principle involved. The spirit of prophets is subject to prophets. The prophet can prophesy when he wishes or he can seize and desist. And 1 Corinthians 14 is a controlled chapter. What that means is this principle holds for all the verbal or oral gifts. We have the power of our own spirit to talk or not. I've had people say to me when I'm praying with them, speak out. They said, it won't come. Well, wait a minute, you're talking to me. That means you've got a voice. You made that come, then make it come talking in tongues. You see. But the thing is, we sit here waiting for God to boom, some, do something to us. I don't know what. He's not going to do that. You're the one who makes it go because you have the power of speech. Hallelujah. Now, another thing. Some people have a hard time opening their mouth and speaking out. Like the lady says, I'm afraid it might be me. The answer was, it'll be you. It won't be your grandmother. And if it's not you, I'm getting out of here fast. <laughs> sure, we take responsibility for the whole thing. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what people think is going to happen. Who's going to do it but them, you know. And, uh, but uh, you have to open your mouth. Speaking in tongues is a venture of faith. Someone said one time, but isn't it risky? Well, open your mouth and take the risk and see what happens. That's how you find out. You'll never find out if you don't try, you know. I was speaking, <laughs> one lady said one time, I'm afraid if I do that, all I will say is blah, blah. Well, open your mouth and say blah, blah and see what happens. That's how you find out. That might be a language. I don't know. I was in front of one little group, I mean a tiny group, eight or ten people one time, and I'm giving them the whole load of hay, you know, I'm telling them everything I know. And I said, open your mouth and say anything. One fellow says, hello. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand. Go ahead and get out. Hallelujah. <laughs> Of course, on that occasion, I had to say, no, not that, you know. <laughs> he took me for what, exactly what I said. But the thing is, we have to open our mouths, we have to speak out. It's our ability to do that. And it really is a thing of the will. I had a lady come down over here in one church one time, and we were trying to help her get the baptism, and she could say, I love you, Jesus, faster than anybody I ever heard say it. And keep on, I love you, and, and, and you can understand it was clear. Boy, she had a fast tongue. I don't know how she did it. But she wasn't getting the baptism. Finally, I said, stop. And she stopped. I said, he knows you love him. You're not telling him anything new. Now, why don't you talk in tongues? She said, I can't. I said, you can't. She said, I can't. I said, you can't. We had a little argument down there. Finally, I said, will you try? She said, yeah. I said, get ready. <laughs> I laid hands on her. She held her breath for a moment. And when she come out this time, I mean talking in tongues and having a big time. Sure you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I've been in places when I've heard somebody, you know, somebody get the baptism, somebody say, let them talk a long time now. Be sure they really got it. You ever hear that one? What's the difference between getting it and really getting it? 
Well, we just want to be sure they're talking in tongues, I guess. Willard Cantillon, I suppose, is one of the finest evangelists in the Assemblies of God. Been a personal friend of mine for well over 40 years. And uh, I read where Cantillon had been in Canada, Quebec, which is French-speaking, and an English-speaking Canadian received the baptism of the Spirit. She only said one word, the French word for God, which is dear. Cantillon says she received the baptism of the Spirit. I have no problem with that. I believe that. Next time I saw him, I said, Willard, come here, let me ask you something. I said, I read, I read where you were in Canada. And the English lady got the baptism and said one word. He said, that's right, Stan, she did. Now, Cantlin added this. He said, now, Stan, we wouldn't want her to stop there. If she will keep faithful in prayer and use that word, God will give her another word. And then another word. She'll have a phrase, then another phrase. She keeps on another phrase. And in due time, she'll have a full-blown language. But you see, our problem is we want them to get it all right now or we don't think they got it. We don't, we don't use our senses correctly. It doesn't matter how they get it and how they start. The matter is how they keep on and what they do for God. That's what we're concerned about. And so I have no trouble with that at all. I've heard people say in the old-fashioned prayer lines, be sure it's a clear speech. You ever hear that one? Oh, wait a minute. Any language you don't know is not a clear speech. You out there? I've been nearly around the world a couple of times. A lot of languages I don't know. Not a clear speech. I've been down south where I want a clear speech. <clears throat> I don't name the state anymore. It got me in trouble once. No, you have no right to call for a clear speech. Any language you don't know is not a clear speech. Not at all. There are 7,010 languages in the world today. You have to know that many languages before you pass a judgment. That's been our problem. We've been judging things that we have no ability to do. I've been in this long enough now that if a person says anything or makes any kind of a noise, I say, hallelujah, thank God he got it. Glory to God. I let God be God. He's the judge of what goes on. You know, that saves me a lot of trouble. I don't have to worry about this anymore. And I, the Lord and I have a little deal on, and that is this. Whoever he lets in, I'm saying, okay. <laughs> Takes a lot of burden off of me. That's his business, not mine. Praise God forever. <clears throat> Somebody says, well, it might be gibberish. Well, how would you know? Again, 7,010 languages in the world. A lot of languages sound like gibberish. There's some tribal peoples down in, the, down in the Far East or in the African continent that have a language that sounds like a grunt. I've read all this. If we heard it, we would say, well, that's not, they're just grunting. And uh, you have no right to judge that at all. The Bible never handles the problem of gibberish. It never handles the problem of whether or not it's a clear speech. Then if the Bible doesn't handle it, how come you and I handle it? We're off base. Have no right to judge it whatsoever. I read one, or I heard one time, where somebody's one of uh, one of the big meetings, and a man jumps up and goes, Bruh! "Somebody said he got the baptism. That's the way they do it down in Africa, where I am." Bruh! Got it. Bruh! Double dose. Bruh! No, no double dose. Just one. <laughs> but now you see, to me, that wouldn't be a language. But it must be to somebody. So we have no right to judge this thing at all. If people get caught up in the Spirit, no matter what they do, I tell you, if you let God be God, it gets more interesting. <laughs> Hallelujah. It gets a lot more interesting. We jump too quickly con to conclusions of what is or what is not of God. Hallelujah. I was in Pasadena, California some time ago preaching for full gospel businessmen. You know how you do. Everybody goes to a banquet, eat. I was the speaker that night. I was a total stranger. I did not know anybody there. That's been so long ago. If I saw them today, I would not know them. A total stranger. I spoke about 125 people there. I gave an invitation. 18 or 20 people came forward, stood in front of the podium, faced me. I did a thing I'd never done in my life, but God was in it. The first was a lady, a well-dressed, meticulously dressed lady, a business lady, suit, business suit. I said to her, this is all public. I said, listen to me, when a baby is born into a family, he has no language, he can't talk. But as he lives in the family, he picks up words in there. They're not his, but he picks them up. 
And then finally, he grows to maturity, the language takes on shape, he understands it, he has a language. I said to this lady, tonight, when I lay hands on you, I'll be praying in tongues, so will others. There's no magic in this. If it will help you, take a, language, take a word from one of us and begin speaking, God will give you your own prayer language. Then I said to this lady, do you understand this? She straightened her blouse and looked up at me and says, well, of course I understand it. I'm a language teacher. She knew exactly what I was talking about. Laid hand her, she got the baptism. Everybody in the room got the baptism of the Spirit. Last night I told you about the Battle of the Coral Sea, in which USS Lexington was sunk. We made our way back to Pearl Harbor in the USS Yorktown. I was in the aircraft carrier Yorktown. We'd come out with one bomb hit, 60 or 70 men were killed. Went back to Pearl Harbor for repairs. When we got back to Pearl Harbor, the commanding officer asked for a six-month overhaul period. Admiral Nimitz says, I'll give you 72 hours. Well, Nimitz knew what was coming. The naval intelligence had already broken the Japanese code. We knew the Armada was coming toward Midway to take Midway. We knew they knew that. <coughs> and so uh, we went in. All he did was patch the deck I told you had been ripped out. All they did was throw a steel well patch over it. Out we went toward Midway. Well, the odds were three to one. About 100 uh, Japanese ships were coming with about 10,000 troops. In this group were six or seven aircraft carriers. And of course, that's the danger in the fleet today is the aircraft carrier with its air arm. And we were outnumbered heavily. While well, we had 30 some odd ships, they had 100 ships. And so uh, we had to do the best we can to engage this fleet. Well, we sailed north to about 150 miles northwest of Midway to stand by and wait for the Japanese attack. The idea was that they would attack Midway. When we got that word, all of our carrier aircraft would attack their aircraft carriers to set them on fire or sink them so their aircraft could not come back to the ship. In other words, kill the air arm of their navy. On the way up there, I was saved. I had a Bible class in the Yorktown, met regularly. Men were getting saved on a regular basis. But on that trip, Coral Sea had been a nerve-wracking experience. On the way up there, a terrible fear gripped my soul. And let me say something to you. There is a mortal fear. If you find a person who said he's never been afraid, write it down, he's out to lunch, or he's never faced reality. And a fear gripped me. Lying on my bunk one night as we were going north, I prayed. I said, God, I know I'm saved. And if this is my time to die, okay, I'm ready. Only one thing I ask you, take this fear out of my heart and my mind so I can do my job. It lifted so readily, I thought somebody was near me. The weight lifted off my shoulders as I lay in the bunk that night. God had literally removed the fear from my heart. And when the ship was sinking and men were dying, what, was, what the psalmist said a um, thousand years ago, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. God took me through the whole thing, even to the sinking of the ship. And I'll have to tell you, I was not afraid after that moment. God had delivered me from it. June 4th arrived. Midway was attacked. We launched our aircraft, and we knew the battle was on. In seven minutes, one aircraft carrier was set afire and sinking, and others had been attacked. And the battle raged all day. And most of all of our aircraft was shot out, of the, shot out of the sky. And so was that of the Japanese. And the Japanese suffered the greatest losses of any modern Navy. In fact, it broke their back. That was the turning point of the war. Now, USS Yorktown was not supposed to get engaged in this battle. Because we were a crippled ship, we were just to be there for a reserve standby. And it looked like it was going to work that way until finally an enemy aircraft followed one of our airplanes back to the ship and we were located. Well, once they know where you are, that's it. <clears throat> and so we had to stand by. Finally, the word came, stand by for air attack. Now, generally, when they have these air attacks, torpedoes and bombers try to come at the same time, the idea being a ship cannot escape everything. But they were not coordinated. For some reason, here came the bombing attack. The torpedoes weren't there at that time. We received three bomb hits right down the stack, completely shut the engines down, and we were dead in the water. 
Now, the terror of that is, if the torpedo attack comes down, you can't get away. No steam, no power. You're sitting ducks in the water. We're vulnerable. Our engineer, we had very fine engineers. In a matter of one hour, they had the engines cross, what we call cross-connected the steam, got us going again. We're doing about 15 knots when all of a sudden, here comes the torpedo attack. They're late, but here they are. But we could not get up enough steam to go fast enough to miss them. If you got enough steam, you can turn into them and avoid. We couldn't do that. And so the torpedo came, and two torpedoes hit simultaneously at the same spot and actually tore the sides out of that ship. Ooh, one big explosion, and it handled that ship like it was a toy. And I was on the third deck, telephone operator, and that ship gave one great big lurch, and down it went, all of a sudden, a list 30 degrees to the port side. All lights out, smoke-filled compartments. And we wonder what we were going to do. And then the commanding officer says, abandon ship. A word you think you'll never hear. What are you going to abandon ship? Well, we had to climb up the decks, had to take our shoes off to do that. Crawled up the decks and got to a scuttle, got up the ladder to scuttle, got to the hangar space. <clears throat> My hangar space torn to bits, and it was made of nickel steel. Great hunks taken out of the hangar deck where the bombs had done it. And uh, water lapping over the lower edge of the flight deck. And on the high side of the, of the flight deck, they had dropped two-inch lines. Men were coming down from the flight deck on those lines. We on the hangar space level would go in. When you found a gap in the line, get on the line and go down. Men going down on the high side. And the idea would be that water always surges at sea. There's always surging water. <clears throat> so when you get down to the end of the line, you don't let go until the water comes up. When it comes up to your level, then you let go, go down with the water. If you let go when the water's down, then it comes up, you're about 30 feet under water. And so you go down to the water. And thank God there was no fire that day. Could have been, we'd, we'd have all burned to death. There were no sharks because of the explosions. Just warm, oily water. Oil over the water, that thick in your eyes, your ears, your nose, all. Oh. I remember looking over the sea before I went down. 2,000 heads bombing out there in the sea. I'm soon going to join them. And tomorrow night, I'll finish this story. What happened in the sea. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your goodness and your mercies to us. Bless your people. Save and fill with the Spirit. We pray in Jesus.